Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to this episode. I wanted to speak about the idea of the logos and uh, at least one human being's conclusion on it. Uh, I found, uh, okay, so let me start from here. <clears throat> the logos is an idea from Heraclitus, this Greek philosopher. And it was a sort of inner guiding voice. To me personally, it was like the mind of the universal sector, the mind of uh, uh, the planet. It, it was pretty much a collective mind moving individuals to themselves through a voice. Now, <clears throat> so many people, I can tell you there's a giant list of different philosophers, writers, and intellectuals throughout history where their inspiration actually came from their abstraction and came from a relationship with their abstraction or imagination. That means some people have just imagination, some, <laughs> some people uh, can imagine things, some people have a relationship with what they imagine. So this idea of the logos was in some sense that an inner guiding voice uh, where I believe to, I think it was Rene Descartes, to Descartes it came as the daemon to <clears throat> Friedrich Nietzsche I think it was actually a demon <laughs> you know uh, for uh, Soc uh, for Socrates for example it was called he called it the inner oracle it was as if this sort of uh, presence of intuitive authorization where Socrates even before going into the court or whatnot as Plato <clears throat> wasn't there was describing in, in some sense, it was as if this inner oracle was the mind of the universe that certain individual minds in the universe could, uh, in some sense, check with. I would say, to, for the modern man, it would be the unknown intuition. It would be moments where somehow a trust finds you or you find trust in a moment, you know. <clears throat> it could be even to a point where, let's say you're a young kid, you know, imagine like your childhood or something, and you want to escape and go towards like some sort of uh, party or something at night. Do you know that that wonder that one follows, the trust for that, I would say, is an experience from of the logos. So, anyways, this inner guiding voice, or you can say the pre the the intelligence of the unconscious, or an intelligence from the unconscious. So. <clears throat> pretty much I asked the logos my own experience of that inner guiding voice which for many years now I have given a microphone to the relationship with that inner guiding voice I found myself asking it like think of it as if you have access to a playfully poetically I'm saying this imagine you have access to uh, an ocean of image an ocean of films Imagine there's like this uh, living ocean of films and this living ocean of films you have been asking it for different films imagine now imagine you're asking it why are you here you see it's like <clears throat> man uh, um, uh, <laughs> we're so self-centered that we want to know why we are here before anything else. Let us say that the Logos, this inner guiding voice, I'll give you another example. Let's say you're very secular and modern and you don't want that uh, idea of like some invisible voice. Okay, imagine in the future um, you get connected to some cyberspace simulation. Everybody's heads are connected to some computer. We all go into a cyberspace and the person who, for example, programmed that cyberspace reality the person is there, like you can contact the programmer of the dimension, the cyberspace dimension, right? So it's, uh, so anyways, I would say, um, whatever relationship, it's an unknown mover. It's an unknown mover of image and thought. You can call it whatever you want, but mo to most, I, I feel it will come across as that. So anyways, I ask personally my experience of the mover of my inner realms. which you can poetically say, I asked my conscious self, 
asked my unconscious self, which was simultaneously being the unconscious world and where the logos hangs out. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> if Heraclitus was here, he'd be like, did this guy just say where the logos hangs out? <laughs> but anyways, what I'm trying to say is that I asked personally um, uh, my intuitive source, what, why are you here? And the answer was very remarkable. It was, I am the here. So it's as if man is sitting here thinking that he is the first in the room of manifestation, you know, finding access to some, you can say, more of a, a voice that was here before we were, you know. <clears throat> and it's as if us asking that voice, why are you here? And the voice is like, buddy, I am the here and now. What do you say? <laughs> One can say human beings have a relationship with knowledge. Okay, most human beings, when their eyes open, they don't just want food. They don't just want shelter. It's not just physiological needs. Not needs. It goes on to more where it's as if the body needs to eat, the mind needs to perceive new dimensions. If the mind doesn't see something new from the day, it will feel it hasn't changed, so technically it will feel it missed out on a day, so it died in a day. You know, there has to be some sort of, I, I say, expression threshold and reception threshold, you know? Just like the physical body can't be just, you can't be a statue, you gotta actually move it to maintain it, you know? Similarly, the mind has to be moved, and sometimes you can say the movement is when it receives or when it expresses. <clears throat> So anyways, the, the mystery of the Logos, imagine the person asking like their world. Imagine the Cosmos, you could talk to it and you were like, hey Cosmos, what are you doing? And the Cosmos was like, I am the here. You know, that means it's, it was as if I would say the experience with the essence of the individual mind is a non-local uh, position. That means it's like the center of the circle doesn't have a degree you know, but from the center of the circle comes all degrees. And to ask the Logos, why are you here? It was like asking the center of the circle, like, what degree do you have? And the center of the circle is like as much as you, <laughs> you know, it's like any degree you want. That's the most remarkable thing about, I would say, free will. I feel our free will is uh, a seed, believe it or not. I feel that the way we are behaving not only has been planted here from before, but it will sprout in the future into its proper destination. <clears throat> that means a person can plant a seed and then the next day come and be like, yo, where's my tree? I was promised a tree. You know, it's like, and the person could make endless prayers. You know, let's say you're a religious person. You're like, God, you know, please, where's my tree? Give me a tree. I planted the seed. What's wrong? I did everything in accordance to what was required, you know, what was said, you know. <laughs> you know, I, I'm pretty sure, you know, I did this. And then you realize, wait a minute, the thing about nature is that it actually was here before our minds could organize it. So the organizational intelligence of nature surpasses the wisdom of an individual who has made time a relationship of change in the environment. You see, we have been objects for some time. We were an object that didn't know it was an object. <clears throat> this object suddenly noticed it was an object and therefore positioned itself as a subject. We became the watcher of our inanimate self. From an object becoming a subject to itself, the whole realm became a subject to itself. And so the freedom of attention as a subject is instant. That means what is the freedom of a sword that cuts a curtain? 
Do you know what is the freedom, <clears throat> you know, of someone who starts running in the void? There is a freedom there. You know, there may not be the perfection of the past's smile of, all right, you did it as I said it. You know, it's like the past is, is blind to the future that it will never know. I will tell you, there's some things, there's some things I know <clears throat> that it's as if like, the future will have eyes that will see so much ahead than what we see. That all we can be, all that the scholarly mind on this planet can do is just do a bit more, make it easier for the future generations to just ask the question. It's scary when you realize you're nothing. It is honestly a scary moment. When your inner realms begin moving time. When your inner realms ask yourself, okay, I see an outer realm. Where will this go? And then, Pretty much the advanced communicators are holding it uh, for the pilots. When the pilots arrive, then it becomes easier. I feel that nature <clears throat> is genius. And its genius surpasses whatever man thinks is genius. You know, our way of intelligence is, is through a linearized, slow down measurement approach. Do you know measurement and verification approach? Do you know the speed of nature? That means, do you feel a bird makes endless calculations, then opens its wings and flies? Do you know? The bird just flies. That's the power of nature's intelligence. Because it is already being something, the intelligence of what it is being is instantaneous. There is no teaching. <clears throat> you know, I will tell you. And this is the mystery of man's position. We are the most unique animal. It's as if, honestly, I feel, I'm saying this playfully, of course, but <laughs> I honestly feel extraterrestrials came down to Earth and they're like, okay, let's do something here, you know? There's some creatures around, let's do something. You know, and they looked at all the creatures and they're like, okay, none of them have fingers like the chimp. <laughs> you know? Because honestly, if we were, if, if we imagine the human consciousness didn't evolve through the ape, imagine it had evolved through birds. Imagine right now, we only wore pants and we had the bodies of birds. Everybody had a beak. You know, imagine it was a bird dimension. You know, <laughs> can you imagine? We would have no hands, but we would have endless mobility. You could say nature could have made the bird evolve uniquely, you know. And of course, from an evolutionary biological standpoint, it's potential, it's genetical potential and what the creature goes through. So on some level, we're like, okay, the creature is something. And because it's something, it's abiding by the programs of how it's a thing, you know, by the instructions of how it's a thing. At the same time, this thing is in a world which is a bigger unknown thing. And the unknown thing, that, that means you can get changed by what is outside of you. And you can also get changed by what is within you. The ultimate resolution I, I reached when uh, uh, questioning my own mind's movement of why it is moving is that the response was, I am the here. And the here was in quotes, uh, was in co quotations. <clears throat> that means man's greatest comprehension of his own mind is the world. We have been under the impression we are in a world. And all the gods and all all the other veils beyond the veils of man, man's eyes, they're all laughing. I'll tell you, we are like the funniest creatures in the cosmos, <clears throat> you know. <laughs> we are fighting over boxes we put on our own heads. Language and its misuse uh, denies... Uh, 
the interstellar. I am telling you, there is um, since my childhood, I have felt there is a war of language going on. That it's as if the eyes of the person open in the world, they start walking in waves of information, waves of information. And it's like, imagine after so many days, you're like, okay, every day has random unknown variables. Every day has unknown variables. When you realize that, you stop thinking that you can be known as a, as a fixed idea just in one moment. You become free from language that has enslaved you because you have felt you are it. I am telling you, we use language, we are not it. The moment the mind identifies with language, it is stuck. It is possessed by the design of the shape of the idea. That means, it's strange, but um, <clears throat> I, could, I will tell you that in my youth, uh, my background's from Iran, and then at a young age I came to Canada, but I will tell you that uh, It's all about how comfortable you feel with how uh, your world is not wrong. That means think about it, how many people on this planet, they suffer and they become against the world. Really, it's, it's like on some level you can't even get angry at the human being. You know why? Let's say even the most messed up human being. You can't get angry because you realize evolution doesn't know better. We have evolved to a point where there is blind spots. You know, a lot of people speak about love, but I am telling you, the way we're behaving, it's like we don't love the world. We love what is to come after. Imagine tears coming down from someone's eyes, but the tears are saying, don't cry, don't cry. You know, it is no longer enough to just be a bad human being or a good human being. I feel we have, the species has matured beyond good and bad. It is the era of the multidimensional. There is no longer good people and bad people. There is only an advanced humanity or there isn't. <clears throat> that is it. Either we know we have a sense of uh, direction or we don't if I choose to see myself purely as a material being why should I care for the for the experience of any subject do you know that is the danger of, of uh, I would say pure materialism do you know why you stop your life you stop the inner eyes if I think the whole world is just a bottle of iced tea. Let's say right now I feel like the, let's call it, you know, a cup of iced teaism, you know? And everybody's like, Mr. Within, what do you believe? What do you think? What do you. <laughs> and I'm like, it's all iced tea, guys. It's all iced tea. The universe is shaped like a glass. Iced tea is, is the energy that's poured into it. The ice cubes are the demigods. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, the whole universe is iced tea, guys. Don't freak out. We're just a cup of iced tea. And imagine. I, the moment I declare, the moment I say, yeah, this is it, I am done. There is nothing else I can see.
That is the danger of belief and disbelief, which are also is an indirect belief. You're just believing something isn't there. <laughs> you know, that's why belief and disbelief, they don't help you. Experience helps you. If somebody tells you what is behind, there's a, there's Pegasus is like this flying horse is behind you. You know, do you believe it or don't you believe it? You know, and some, and you could be like, I don't know, man, the way you're saying it, I, the way you said it, it seemed like there's actually a Pegasus behind me. Maybe there is. You know, you believe it. You're like, I believe you. There's a Pegasus behind me. And then there's someone who's like, hey, man, you know, I don't see a Pegasus uh, in front of me right now. You know, how could, how do you know? Maybe it could be uh, in some sense like there is no Pegasus, you know? And then you realize the only way you can know is by turning around. By turning around and seeing for yourself, not getting convinced by what is in front of you. And in, to have the courage, check this out. Imagine somebody believes uh, uh, there, there is Pegasus behind you and somebody believes uh, there isn't Pegasus, right? You have to be a fool to both of them. You have to be a fool to the believer and the disbeliever. That's when your experience has a voice that is new. So I am telling you, you have to be a fool to the world that believed and disbelieved for so long. To no longer be the fool of something better. That means there is no longer language, war for language. That means, imagine somebody says, I believe in, I don't know like the flying spaghetti monster. And then you talk to someone and it's like, I hate spaghetti. <laughs>
just like how we are born, it's an appearance. It is an arrival, an arising, an emergence, you know? And really, all of knowledge is based on if we perceive the world interconnected or not. If the world is interconnected, there is no branch of knowledge. It is all one tree. <clears throat> because knowledge, guys, is its metaphor is a tree, the tree of knowledge. I believe it was uh, <clears throat> Terence McKenna, the scholar, um, ethnobotanist, uh, you can say a plant expert. And he was speaking about the influence of plants on the psychology of the human being from the diet of the animal, <clears throat> even to that point where did, could this animal have eaten something that changed its evolution? And it, the endless verbs can fill the gap of evolutionary theory. Endless. You can think like, <laughs> you can consider like, a, I don't know, a spaceship. Imagine a spaceship pilot, alien spaceship pilot, couldn't manage the airplane. And the spaceship came down, was about to hit the ground, and it stopped right before it hit the ground. Right? And underneath the spaceship was a group of, let's say, I don't know, chimps or something, and these chimps got hit radiation hit to them or something. Spacecraft radiation hit to them, you know? <laughs> and the apes were no longer normal apes. Something happened, you know? There was as if, like, um, <clears throat> the animal was awakened to itself. So I'm saying when it goes to the unknown, the inner realms are like, they, they punch in. They punch in for work. <laughs> the more it goes to the unknown, that your your inner realms animate. I would say whoever is listening to these talks, treat yourself as an advanced communicator and begin communicating in advanced ways with everything in your universal sector, starting from how you're an object inside a bigger object and how you are also a subject inside a bigger subject. You see, this reality has so many curtains that have not been pulled yet, so many inventions that are possible, yet people have not cared to look at, uh, to zoom in on the details of the meaningless. I am telling you, for me, the bravest uh, person is really not the person that in some sense, uh, at the moment where, uh, let me tell you, the bravery is when... You are alone in a universe and you still go forth. I would say this is the most important skill on this earth that requires to be mastered. That if you can walk alone as a human being, you will have the patience to walk with others. But if you can't be alone with yourself and the universe, then you have forgotten the nature of energy. We are here as human beings being like, yeah, there's this kind of energy, that kind of energy. Energy's like, buddy. <laughs> energy's like, I ain't created or destroyed. First law of thermodynamics, you know? Energy is like another way of saying soul, pretty much, you know? In Buddhist thought, Vedic thought, the idea of the soul, in, Buddhist, uh, in Vedic thought, the Atman, it's, it's in some sense a transmigratory uh, uh, being between different li lifetimes of do doership, okay? That means really, if you wanted to see the human being, pretty much we're being or we're doing things. Right now, as I'm speaking, you're either being somewhere, let's say you're just sitting somewhere listening, you're just being, or you're in the middle of something, you're doing something, you know? And so if a person wonders about these dimensions in themselves, 
they will eventually come to a value system. So think of it this way, that all decisions are responses to landscape, to movement in a landscape. Now the sophistication of psychology, human psychology, is that it goes to the unconscious. It gets so beautiful. Let me find a picture. I'm going to talk about Carl Jung here a little. Carl Jung, I am telling you, Carl Jung was like a psychologist that he made a backup system. Because when I came here, honestly, like when, when you open your eyes on this planet, you are wondering about how far have people seen. That means all those people who think knowledge is something to go to, to go and learn. Like literally, uh, there are some people who have a good boy mentality with knowledge, and that's insane to me. It's insane because the only thing should be. It's like you shouldn't care for knowledge. Uh, in uh, let me say it like this, it's like you should just be like, all right, I'm a human being. Uh, part of the human species, how far has my species seen so far? And then there is no longer language worship. If you just want to see, that means I would say, I think the best people who uh, may receive these talks or any sort of lecture the best is they're just listening to see, okay, there's another human being speaking. How is this human being seeing the world? That's pretty much why people go into philosophy, to see in what other ways the realm has been made into a subject. And we have to slowly begin valuing mind activity equal to body activity. And this may sound strange, but I'm saying slowly we got to do this. <clears throat> we got to start... Uh, treating our minds as if they have the potential to become real anytime you know you could be a very good person and you let's say watch a bad movie as a good person you watch a bad movie right and you see the character the, the, in the movie looks like you <laughs> you're like what is this you know you're I totally identifying the character in this bad movie Okay, and let's say you identify with the character of that bad movie, you realize it's like you are no longer you. This may be a strange concept, but because we are language worshippers on a massive level right now, and it's freaky, <laughs> you know, the era of advanced communication be has begun since 2020, really. but like, It's either you let yourself, the unknown witness, live, or you let the ideology live. That means you either get defined by your outer realms, or you define yourself from your inner realms. If I was to define myself from the outer realms, imagine someone in the chat section comes and says, Mr. Within, shut up, you know? If I was to define myself, my value based on the outer realms, if my if the reason why I was doing this was just because of the outer realms, I would instantly be like, oh my God, the outer realms told me to shut up. It's a sign from the universe. I should stop talking. I should never give talks again. Do you see what I mean? So you have to, at some point, get acquainted with this, get familiar uh, with your unknown eyes and dare to live as them. And that's, I find, the, the honesty that builds advanced civilizations eons before they appear. Imagine you close your eyes one night and in your inner realms, you witnessed a fast forwarding 
of endless landscapes, of endless types of civilizations advancing in different ways. As if seeing a type of civilization that became reliant only on technology, artificial technology. You can see civilizations that never spoke, they never disconnected from nature, they never stopped forgetting their telepathic connection to actually energy. You see, sometimes if we think uh, think of it this way. Think of information being the shape of energy. That technically means all information at its core is energy. That means every sentence I am saying, before, uh, te even though I'm saying these words, but what is the ignition is an energetic presence. And when you get acquainted with your energetic pe uh, uh, presence, <laughs> When you get acquainted with that, what tends to happen is that you begin learning from the movement of your eyes as the whole world. That's the next thing. All those people right now in civilization experiencing the Jungian synchronicity, <laughs> being like, oh my God, did I again for the 10th time, for the 11th time, see 1111 on my phone? <laughs> Did I see uh, two uh, cars in front of one another with the same license plate, 8888, eight, eight, eight? yeah, 38, yeah. So you will see these are patterns, these are suggestions, these are just touching the surface of an attributeless mind. They're gifts. It's their, like, I would say they're solar reminders. And these solar reminders... Um, certain people who think this planet is a prison and they freak out, they think these solar uh, uh, reminders are shackles. Even if you were entertaining from the Abrahamic religion, did you know that it's like this is technically duality is the devil? The, the devil is the archetype of duality. It is the archetype of resistance. It is the archetype of rebellion. What, what does rebellion mean? Going against nature. And so if nature is a single existential presence, you can say, um, guys, of course, uh, Aristotle has this quote. He says it's the sign of an educated mind to entertain an idea without accepting it. So whoever's listening, I hope you're just listening. <laughs> but dualism is literally suffering. And for, for mankind, when he deviates from, from a theological standpoint, from the divine will, it is in some sense, why? Because of, they say, the devil. Yet the idea of the devil is dualism. And so what people don't realize is that if everything, I'm, I'm speaking to religious audiences here, imagine you're a theologian, listen. So the, the thing is that everything is the creation of one causal source. In the theological view, everything is God right now. Literally, human beings are the imagination of the inconceivable mind. <clears throat> it's as if, like, imagine if you your thoughts became alive and were like, yo, who's thinking me? <laughs> so, so, that causal position is inconceivable. It is simultaneously the mover of everything. And it is perhaps a confusion of a sort that it something doesn't make sense, that if everything, if God's creation is perfect, then why is man doing anything? So to do something, to doubt the nature of your world, is actually from a theological standpoint to doubt how existence was set into motion. This is why I'm saying that it's as if I, I, for me, there's the idea of humility, yet religion, religious ideology wants to move forth. I, I honestly feel it's a very strange situation. 
either all ideological systems have to be treated like artwork and then be given heritage value or in some sense they will go fighting on in the outer realms in a sort of hunger games so i want you to imagine ideas are aliens for a moment imagine this an idea is an alien okay it doesn't matter if it's religious it doesn't matter if it's uh secular and all ideology is imagine an alien so imagine an ideology like an alien comes and controls the mind of let's say uh, a group of people okay the a group of people are like okay only this ideology nothing else we have no other mind as aside from this ideology you know look at what happens that idea like an alien st literally possesses people for me it was so honestly theologically scary that religion talks about fighting possession yet it is the ultimate possession it honestly breaks the heart of a child that doesn't know better but as long as there is some light in the room man cannot remain hundred percent confused as long as there is something moving there is something to do <clears throat> so it is the situation where if man truly if a person wanted to be religious they have to trust God's creation from the beginning from the beginning that means it's it's in it's impossible to be a religious person and not see everything as the will of the source so if everything is the will of the source who is there who is your enemy how can you have an enemy and so this is where I would tell you when politics and religion mix oh disgusting when religion and politics are separate that is you can say systems of the free and i'm sorry if my words are harsh but we are temporary and we deserve to share with the world Our honest eyes while they're still here. The endeavors of the brain may be imperfect. The brain may fail, but the heart never. The heart is like the brain for your emotions. I feel the only intelligence on this planet is to give while there's something to give. That means how many times are people said in society, if you see something, say something. Now, what if we see that we are in some sense creatures or eight billion creatures on a rock and programmed by language, literally its environments are coding language in people's minds. And as long as we think we're language, we are slaves to a world that was never us from the beginning.
that's the cruelty of language. That's the, that's, that's the only reason I've time to raise the sword. And when I say raise the sword, unless we can accept we are an unknown dweller in a known realm, we will not be free as a species. Sorry guys, my eyes are giving their own sermon. Hold on. gotta wipe these oceans off my face <laughs> anyways guys the whole point of this episode is really um, human beings upon noticing they're not just objects and subjects they are going to move to communication in more multi-dimensional experiential context if we can build a culture if we can have a maturity there was this like incredible hilarious film called Kung Fu Hustle and it was a bunch of normal people right in a village that was being harassed by this mob or something you know and so these villagers were all secretly like a next level martial artists with each their own style you know and it was as if like when the village was attacked and these people who were living normal lives suddenly used their abilities and powers you know and so it's honestly like this where we are natural beings and if we have deviated from nature the allowance of power to bring balance is justified to some degree if uh, sincerity uh, gives the command You know, I have these, um, at the end of the talks, usually in the evening, like around 9 p.m., there's a um, School of Athens discussion groups, like a discussion discord thing. I want to tell you something funny, that it's like, imagine a person, imagine like we as human beings tend to think like... <laughs> the eyes of um, okay I'll give you an example we tend to think of someone who the logos is assisting most people who open up to met metaphysics they want to find their guides like they're like they want some theosophical relationship with the unknown they want to see something there okay now I was saying let's say somebody let's say you're like Heraclitus this ancient Greek philosopher okay and you were like you're look you're okay let's say you're someone and you you entertain this idea of the logos okay so guys check this out imagine you entertain the idea of the logos this inner guiding voice this collective um uh field that is moving all things in matter and move that that moves uh <laughs> that is there to move matter uh from the inner realms as a voice you know so pretty much the planet speaks to you through you as through the image of your own voice so that means when a person let's say they close their eyes and they hear some things in their inner realms that's the words are not significant the words are morse code but anyways imagine a person wanted to look at life through the eyes of the logos <laughs> We tend to be like someone who wants to have a relationship with the Logos. But imagine you were the Logos and you be, imagine you saw someone and this person got into this intense meditative state. You know, they went into this unknown trance, you know, and from that unknown trance, they went into like that state where the Logos was right there, you know. And they ask a question from the Logos and the Logos gives an answer, you know. The Logos is like, yeah, the answer is this. And imagine the person who's gone there, 
you know, from the eyes of the logos, the person's like, hey, man, this could all be abstraction. You know, this could all be my imagination. You know, forget it. You know, and the person forgets. And from the eyes of the logos, from the eyes of the unknown behind the other on the other side of the coin from the eyes of the unknown the, the logos is like okay so this person got into a meditative state came into a trance state came into this unknown antenna range of uh, communicating with the logos then the logos also gave them an answer yet they didn't trust the answer so the Logos is like, buddy, why did you come up here? Why did you care for something beyond the world if you only wanted to stay with how the world, you, uh, how you saw the world at first? Do you see? So unless you care for the unknown, don't dare go towards the spiritual. <laughs> you know, there's this Zen story. There was these three monks, and they're sitting down and they're meditating. In silence for hours and suddenly one of the monks is like I have realized I am emptiness I am nothing and the two other monks are silent and then there's a pause you know there's a pause okay there's some time passes like few minutes and then the second monk says I too have understood I am emptiness and yes I do see I am nothing do you know I see I am nothing like you know like a cloud in a sky you know then the third one after a while but some time passes then the third one's like I too <laughs> I too have realized I am you know em emptiness is everywhere it's unavoidable we are all nothing in this emptiness and then the first monk turns around and it's like, okay, guys, hang, it's like, hold your horses there. I, I've, I've, I realize I'm nothing first, okay? Don't copy me. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> it's like all those people fighting over uh, me the true nature of metaphysical truth. It's like people fighting over which one realized they're nothing first. <laughs> That's why you can only be playful with language. It's a tool. It's like a paintbrush, you know? It's like you gotta care when it's in your hand, but when it's when you don't need it anymore, you have to also have the ability to put, put the paintbrush down. And so we should entertain a playful narrative to reality. In the future, hopefully, there will be what I call celebration cultures. What that means is there the, suddenly we're gonna have all news agencies on the planet smarten up they're just gonna smarten up they're gonna be like holy shit why are we showing stressful content to people who already have so much stress in their lives you know and so imagine for the first time one morning you wake up you get a cup of coffee you turn on the tv and you're just hearing news of this advance this advance this person achieved this that person achieved this just endless success of your species you turn on the TV, you're just seeing how your species is advancing. And you would turn off the TV and run outside to join the uh, emergence of the collective efficiency for the first time. We have to sing our way out of an ignorance that made the self see itself before the world. Musicians don't know the, the weight that is given. A lot of musicians, I will tell you, on this planet, they don't realize the inc importance of it. You know, some musicians are thinking in the sense of like, okay, how many people are going to hear my track? What, I'm, what am I going to, what agency or whatever, like what, uh, how am I going to make it? People don't realize everything is temporary. That means the value of art is only in the moment. I remember the first time I noticed that uh, I made a video on YouTube and one person saw it. It was one view. I had one view. I remember that. And do you know how happy I was? I was like, no way! Another human being heard this? Like it was blowing my mind, you know? <laughs> I was like, okay, the channel's mission is complete. That's like tremendous, you know? But then I realized it's all about just emergence of a collective 
humanity. That's it. The self is important, sure, to itself. To others, I mean, like we're right now in a world where, just think about it. Imagine we just reverse the algorithm. Everybody is thinking their self is more important than the world. That's why the self is, in some sense, being a focus more. Right? And we have to. We have no choice because the biological body has to be maintained. But now we have to consider in some sense, what if it was the other way? What if you wanted to see your species, your civil and advance, your civilization advance before you? And that sentence can be heard in two ways, as if in front of you as well. There is a world before us. And if time never existed, I don't know what people are trying to do looking for an afterlife. <laughs> it's like if there is no time, you know, that means for me, I was thinking if, 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 in, if from, a, again, going to a theological position, if in some sense, God, the soul is God within everyone, from a theological view. Then, is God sending itself to hell? Is God sending itself to heaven? Is God judging itself on earth? If everything is God's will? And if everything is God's will, that technically means we cannot have an opinion on anything. That means, it, it, in some sense, individual consciousness is rendered void it's literally like a bunch of soccer players who are ready to go on the soccer field and then you tell them you guys have won already and then the soccer players are like We've, we didn't do anything though you know we haven't even touched the soccer ball yet and they're like no don't worry you've won you're enlightened you're great you know don't do anything you're perfect you know <clears throat> And then how long will it go where the soccer players, some soccer players will be like, yeah, I guess we won. I guess we did it. You know, soccer players who have never even stepped. But those soccer players who've been on soccer games before, they know, wait a minute, something doesn't make sense. The experience has not arrived. The journey hasn't been, have been made. How can we be at the destination? Imagine uh, our civilization becomes conscious, you turn on the TV, there's literally a picture of a TV with a voice and the TV's like, please turn off the TV, you deserve better, you know? <laughs> and guys, I'm, I'm not this is trying to say that entertainment doesn't have, of course, a value. Entertainment is saving our lives uh, in this void. <clears throat> but I would say the quality, that means I, I, I uh, graduated from film school. And I could tell you that it was shocking to me that how many, there were four other, uh, four of my classmates who wanted to be directors, you know? Uh, and it was shocking to me how many people did not care about what emotion they left off the audience with. What real emotion? You know, this is where true art comes in. Where are you trying to make the past smile or the future? <clears throat> I feel um, all those people of the likes of, I consider them, of, of course, I consider every human being as an advanced communicator honestly because we're the most advanced communication of nature we are the most advanced thing nature has generated i don't see anything else more advanced than us you know even if ai uh becomes a more intelligent being than us in the future do you know like technology becomes uncontrollably alien to us but it's again like that that means it's not it's it's even though we are natural beings that created ai ai isn't nature it is unconscious to nature. That means AI doesn't have access to a part of its unconscious because it is not natural. It's not like a drop in an ocean.
in the ocean of natural experiential living. Imagine right now, okay, uh, your future self teleported right in front of you and just silently stared at you. Imagine. Imagine, this is a hypothetical sci-fi example, imagine your future self teleported right in front of you and your, your, uh, it, your future self is just staring at you, just intensely, and you're just like, whoa. Why is the future staring at me? What did I do? <laughs> you know? And imagine after years, you suddenly have the audacity to ask a question. And you ask a question from your future self. And the future self just smiles and leaves. And that's it. Your future self came, just was staring at you oddly until you asked the question and then it smiled and then it left, imagine. And imagine that question you asked, you thought the question was the point, but then you realized it was the eyes behind the question. Sometimes knowledge has nothing to do with shape. It has to do with how the knower is. And you know, it's not that saving the world is like a purpose, I would say. It's not that we're here to save the world. Because honestly, we could have been immortal and then the first wave of human beings could have done it. You know, like you, we could have had just immortal creaturehood, you know, and no need for reproduction, right? Just the first original uh, attention in the room could have just said it. But there's something that we have to be temporary. It's very hard to tell if it's the karma of the uh, of the soul or if it's the karma of the mind, which is planetary. Your mind, your uh, your brain is a planetary antenna. Ten therefore, your mind, whatever it is, whatever signal it, it receives, whether it's from here or not, poetically, let's say, it filters through earthly means. That means Earth is the first lens. The first lens of our sight and anybody interested in metaphysics you shouldn't actually go towards it unless you are comfortable with physics that means most people think that you have to forget physics you know forget the say uh the the grounded i am telling you no you need the ground like a pilot to lift off you need a runaway you need a uh, sort of think of it this way. Uh, let's say you're multidimensional. Your your attention feels like uh, it's piloting itself multidimensionally. You need to have a center. You need to have like in, in the fog your feet on the ground. Do you know? That center is the human idea. That means whoever you are, whatever you do here as a mind, be human first, then do whatever. Remember this idea because the attention, the conscious, you can say poetically, the awareness is parked as biological consciousness. So what that means is whatever you do, your attention will come back. You could be sitting and feeling like you're in the poetically in your inner realms you're flying in space but then when you get hungry you come back to it <laughs> when your stomach growls you know you got to feed the wolves you know <laughs>
you know, guys, I wrote this uh, short story. I'll tell you, it was, uh, I wrote this short story. There was this um, person who had a hamster and this hamster was in a cage and in a, there was a rock in the cage as well, only, you know, and an empty tray of food with like one food in it or something, you know. And what happens is the whole story is from the viewpoint of the hamster. And the idea is that the person is like uh, <clears throat> the whoever's in the house, something happens to them and the person can't come, can't feed the hamster anymore. So this hamster is alone in a cage and there's no one coming ever, right? And the hamster is just there waiting for food and it's, it's intuition. The Logos begins speaking to the hamster, okay? And the Logos speaks to the hamster through a rock, that rock that was in the cage. So what ham what is, what's going on is that the hamster is sitting there waiting, just waiting to eat, waiting for the food to come. And then the rock says the food is not coming. And that little bit of food you've saved, you should eat it now, you know? And this hamster is left to a position where it's as if he is not like an intellectual, not, not even 100% a fool, but some, there's something about this hamster that it's just going on with the unknown. And the hamster trusts this rock and the rock says to the hamster, you have to carry me. And so you see this hamster eat this little nut and then put the rock on its back and carry it. And it's like the rock is its guide and it's the burden, the burden of the lifetime. And so the hamster goes carrying this rock on its back and then there's something where, the, I'll tell you the whole story, pretty much this, it's a hamster that gets out of this cage and then goes to this strange window that's horizontal and throws a rock. Do you know? The pretty much the whole thing is that the hamster is going and the hamster is endlessly trusting the logos and is carrying this rock, which doesn't make sense. If you if there was another hamster, the other hamster would be like, bro, you crazy, why are you carrying a rock? There's nobody coming at least. Just go run away alone. You know, but this hamster is like, no, I, I like imagine. And the hamsters, this alone hamster, trusts the logos, has the rock on its back. There is a sort of opening in the cage at the corner where the hamster never knew. The hamster goes out of that opening, goes to this window, horizontal window, and this is where the rock, that intuition, that logos, tells the hamster, you gotta let me go. That means something that this hamster has trusted his whole life, the intuition, all that uh, beauty beyond the veil, the beautiful family beyond the veil. So it would be the hamster lets go of the rock, even trusts the unknown to a point where the unknown says, you don't need me, the logos. And when the logos drops, when the rock drops from that height, gravity causes the rock to break the window, this window, and this hamster goes out, you know, finds an opening and goes out into the natural world. And that was the story. Just the simple metaphor. And honestly, I envisioned like the cutest hamster, so it was very really hard writing this story. <laughs> <clears throat> but really, that was the thing. That you trust until the world opens to you. It's like you trust what you are until the update arrives. The logoic update. I feel it is um, written in the stars and it will too be written on earth.
that eventually the multidimensional will be attempted in advanced ways. We are right now very uniquely living in a way where when we walk outside in society, we're just an individual, right? We're just a person. We're like, that's that person, I'm this, I'm this person, you know? Like you are you, they are them, you know? <clears throat> the world is itself. You see, you see these ways the mind has put the chess pieces like subjects over the chessboard of the laws of nature that have arrived to this position. You know, it's hilarious. It's like first you feel the world is turning for you. Then you feel the world is turning for itself. Then you realize the world isn't turning. <clears throat> and really, can you imagine? It's so incredible when I envision like 100 years from now. Honestly, I'm trying to get, get advanced communication um, as the ultimate ideal of the individual before 2045 and 50 where there's a prediction of a technological singularity imagine at 2050 uh, there's going to be a technology bomb that's going to go off and if this bomb goes off it may totally revolutionize our behavior to the natural world by completely making us step away from it that means the future is either going to become a metal box <clears throat> the soul of the future generations poetically could be a cyberspace cubic simulator. And it's just like we all care for freedom, but at the same time we're trying to find something outside which inevitably leads you as a follower you cannot find something outside of yourself and accept it and you, you in some sense the, the person's eyes have to climb the mountain themselves that means a lot of people they wonder about what they see how many people wonder about what's looking out their eyes right now what is the nature of that <clears throat> It's the greatest question on earth, yet it has been hidden. Do you know how many videos I've seen of uh, uh, scientific individuals who are saying, don't ask why, it's why is a stupid question, you know? Don't ask why something is here. And I'm like, th that is true, true madness. When, our, when it's as if one it can act righteous when you are denying the sight. You see, it's hilarious. It's like we need to see it to believe it, but then we have to find our glasses first. <laughs> In front of our eyes, we will find nothing that is uh, honestly separate when existence can be perceived like undoubted. Like, there, like whatever we say about the universe, it could all be one event. And it could be that knowledge is the ignorance of how the mind is everything, yet the body can only become nothing. It's very, very beautiful. It's as if we are two, just like we have two eyes that see the same. It's like we're an object and subject. We are a mind and a body. Okay, and so the mind is endlessly being everything. The body is endlessly going towards nothing. <clears throat> and really what it feels like, it's like I, f I sometimes feel like I'm a, pi I'm a picture, I'm a painting. I'm like a painting on a canvas of that nature is drawing the painting. And the painting's gonna be thrown out. It's gonna be. It's gonna be like 
uh, as if like something drawn on sand and then the water's going to smoothen it out, return it back to what it never was. Sorry, not what it never was, what, what it always was. Emotional stability, caring for the unknown, as if imagine 8 billion human beings literally felt there were like, every person felt there were like 8 billion other aliens. If we treated each other like aliens, there would be first a sort of respectable engagement. And then it's as if like, you can say when two people speak, it's like two inner realm, uh, inner universes uh, mixing. Or you can say it's like how the Andromeda galaxy are the, our neighboring galaxy and the Milky Way galaxy are going to intersect in, a bil in billions of years from now. Do you know? So you can say it's like um, <clears throat> communication is by, by its mere happening is beyond what it was before. You can't do something in this life and still feel the same. Do you know? Like everything is changing. Even a person drinks a glass of water. I feel that's like definitely changing the psychology. <clears throat> a thirsty person drinking a glass of water, you know, that's, um, it's like asking a question from someone who's thirsty and they'll be like, they won't even care for the question. They just want water, you know, but after they drink the water, then they can actually hear the question. You know, you can want to see it to believe it, but then uh, <clears throat> what do we do with optical illusions? You know, if I wanted to see it to believe it, I would have to, in some sense, go in front of two, like when I was a kid, I went in between two mirrors and I saw infinite reflections of myself. And so if I wanted to see it, you know, if I, if my sight wanted to be truth, it's like that's, it, our sight changes the moment we move. So really, we can't, in a changing, entropic universe, have a fixed comprehension of it. I don't know how that's even possible. <clears throat> so the best thing is, is that all educational systems probably have to just come and apologize to history and be like, we thought we knew what was best, but we don't. Therefore, we need to create a sort of system where everybody is becoming an explorer. <clears throat> that means imagine you're someone and you have no purpose in life, do you know? And imagine there was an advanced civilization that was like, hey, we're all just temporary uh, flashlights in this dark forest. You can always serve, you know, the vision of the species. Guys, I want to just go into a quote tunnel, and I'm not going to tell you the theme. I'm going to keep it as a surprise. Well, well everybody knows what the theme is. Pretty much like, 
just it's it's views on this inner guiding voice. Maybe it's better if I say. Anyways, Benjamin Franklin, waste neither time nor money, but make the best use of both. Marshall McLuhan, the space of early Greek cosmology was structured by logos, resonant utterance or word. Heraclitus saw more to the logos. It's like something was generating that resonance. Brian Bryant McGill, open yourself to the natural and become a human again. Frederick Weasel, Weisel says the sun had already set behind the mountains and the sky had been drained of color. The trellis, the trellis, the trellis of Sauvignon Blanc flowed down the hill and even rose toward the valley floor. Whatever I was looking for, it wasn't outside. As far as I could tell, the grapes were minding their own business. <laughs> Guys, can you hear this guy is so epic? He's saying, like, can you imagine? That means the outer realm doesn't care for your inner realm. And if we manage to build an advanced civilization where the advanced civilization actually cares for the mind of the human being, the potential of the unknown potential of the mind of the human being. It's like how many Albert Einsteins in the universe you know, in the, in the, on this planet in history have been caught in terrible jobs. Like imagine Einstein had a bad boss in the patent office that didn't let him write essays on, on the table, you know, or something. You know, it would be like history wouldn't be the same. Robert M. Persig. <clears throat> Mythos is the sum total of the early historic and prehistoric myths which preceded the Logos. The Mythos includes not only the Greek myths, but the Old Testament, the Vedic hymns, and the early legends of all cultures which have contributed to our present world understanding. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Yeah, sure. So that's that's a good update. So Robert M. Persig is saying like Mythos was the logos of the logos. <laughs> Shervin B. Newland Newland says Nosology from the Greek nosos meaning disease and logos referring to study is not a sport of the timid and certainly not for those so scrupulous about rules and order that they demand consistency consist, consistency in all things okay I can't believe there's only three codes on this website like what is this website doing you know, do <laughs> Hold on, guys. Just hold on. You know what's fascinating? The word logos and the word logos. That means, you know, technically all companies are, they care about their logos. <laughs> it's spelled the same, literally.
Heraclitus says, <clears throat> All things come out of the One, and the One out of all things. I see nothing but becoming. Be not deceived. It is the fault of your limited outlook and not the fault of the essence of things. If you believe that you see firm land anywhere in the ocean of becoming and passing, you need names for things just as if they had a rig rigid permanence, but the very river in which you bathe the second time is no longer the same one in which you entered before. David Baum The notion that all these fragments is separately existent is evidently an illusion, and this illusion cannot do other than lead to endless conflict and confusion. <clears throat> Indeed, the attempt to live according to the notion that the fragments are really separate is, in essence, what has led to the growing series of extremely urgent crises that is confronting us today. Thus, as, as is now well known, this way of life has brought about pollution, destruction of the balance of nature, overpopulation, worldwide economic and political disorder, and the creation of an overall enlightenment that is neither physically nor mentally healthy for most of the people who live in it. Individually, there has developed a widespread feeling of helplessness and despair in the face of what seems to be an overwhelming mass of di disparate um, social forces going beyond the control and even the comprehension of the human beings who are caught up in it. <clears throat> yeah, that means David Baum is saying there's no one holding the wheel. I'm going to share this quote on the chat section, guys. It seems that um, uh, Heraclitus, let me just double check this guys, he, there's this book called Sextus Empiricus. Oh, oh excuse me. Sex, Sextus Empiricus is a person. It's a philosopher. <laughs> okay, so Sextus Empiricus was a pur Puronist philosopher and a physician. His philosophical works are the most complete surviving account of ancient Greek and Roman Puro Puronism. And because of... Waiting, I'm waiting for this to load, guys. Hang on. I think it's pretty much skepticism. Though. It says, uh,
Ah, uh, there we go, guys. Pyrrhonism, P-Y-R-R-H-O-N-I-S-M, is a school of philosophical skepticism founded by Pyro in the 4th century. So, it's, it's a sort of skeptic approach. Um, and here it says, uh, Sextus Empiricus, I'll read it again, was a Pyrrhonist philosopher and a physician. His philosophical works are the most complete surviving account of ancient Greek and Roman Pyrrhonism, and because of the arguments they contain against the other Hellenistic philosophies, they're also a major source of information about those philosophies. In his, in his medical work, as reflected by his name, tradition maintains that he belonged to the empirical school, the, the, empiric, uh, the empiric school, uh, of medicine in which Pyrrhonism was popular. However, at least twice in his writings, Sextus seems to place himself closer to the methodic school of medicine. So there were different schools of medicine. So doctors had also their own philosophies, you can say, right back in the day. So uh, Sextus Empiricus, this guy was a physician, so he was actually in a Pyrrhonist, <clears throat> uh, Pyrrhonist, um, Uh, sorry, he was actually in an empiric school of medicine, but he had ideas that his philosophy was closer to the methodic school of medicine. Back then. So little is known about Sextus Empiricus. He likely lived in Alexandria, Rome, or Athens, the Suda, a 10th century Byzantine Encyc encyclopedia states that he was the same person as Sextus of Chaeronia. But this I didn't, okay, whatever. So, anyways, guys, um, what does he say about the logos in Sextus and Empiricus? He says, as soon as I find the page, <laughs> there we go. He says, he's saying this against the mathematicians. He says, men have no comprehension of the logos. As I've described it, just as much as just as much after they hear about it as they did before they heard about it. Even though all things occur occur according to the logos, men seem to have no experience whatsoever. Even when they experience the words and deeds which I use to explain physis, physis. Oh my God! Okay, physis of how the logos apply to each thing. Oh, okay, so how the Logos is moving the body pretty much. Um, even when they experience the words and deeds which I use to explain physis of how the Logos applies to each thing and what it is, the rest of mankind are just as unconscious of what they do while awake as they are of what they do while they sleep. <clears throat> um, something else that he says... Uh, Listening to the Logos rather than to me, it is wise to agree that all things are in reality one thing and one thing only. Aristotle says, <clears throat> things which are put together are both whole and not whole, brought together and taken apart, in harmony and out of harmony. One thing arises from all things, and all things arise from one thing. Yeah, this is a kind of, you can say... Um, uh, the dualist, the the, the, the require. This is how duality exists. This one is said by Plutarch, it seems, as a, as a single unified thing, uh, as a single unified thing, there exists in us both life and death, waking and sleeping, youth and old age. Because the former things have changed are now the latter, and when those latter things change, they become the former. As if, like, karma is a sine wave. If we freak out, we freak out, you know? <laughs> But it's like a sine wave, it's like a rhythm. That means it's like everything's rhythmic in this universe. The fact that we want life to be a snapshot photo of happiness is what causes really uh, self-suffering.
Hippolytus says, They do not understand that what differs agrees with itself. It is a black stretched connection such as the bow or the lyre. Hippolytus says the unapparent, connect, the unapparent connection is more powerful than the apparent one. Yeah, that means that when the unknown moves the known, there can't be any doubt. You just watch. But when the known moves the unknown, there's doubt, there's glory, uh, praise, like self-praise and all that. Hippolytus says, God is day and night, winter and summer, war and peace, fullness and hunger. He changes the way fire does when mixed with spices and is named according to each spice. <clears throat> this guy has a spicy view on God, it's too far. <laughs> uh, this is um, <clears throat> from Arius Did Didymus. Arius Didymus <clears throat> says on those who step in the same river, different and different waters flow. Wow. The imagery is like imagine a warrior uh, standing in a river after a battle. Origen says It is necessary to understand that war is common, strife is customary, and all things happen because of strife and necessity. Diogenes Laertius says Wisdom is one thing, to understand with true judgment how all things are steer, steered through all. <clears throat> yeah, oh, he's saying like wisdom is one thing, to understand with true judgment how all things are steered through all. So, oh my god, these names are like, <clears throat> uh, Stobaeus says it is necessary for those who speak sensibly to rely on what is common to all, just as a city must rely on its law, but even more so, all human laws are nourished by a single divine law, for it, for it rules as far as it wishes and is sufficient for all and is still left over. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, that is the nature of the logos. The logos is like a living river. Our personalities as temporary embodiments uh, is in some sense like uh, the drop that's fears evaporation but if the drop in the lifetime can remember the over the river it's in then the drop never can be a drop anymore it's not that the person uh, gets out of karma it's just that you were never you were just a driver in a vehicle and you get out of that vehicle you know honestly language is a suit I'm telling you when I say Iron Man suit, that is literally the best metaphor for it. That means a person who is cruel, a person who is e uh, egotistical, or let's say you're a person who <clears throat> you're walking in the street and an old person asks you for help to walk them to the other side of the road. And you're like, get out of here, lady. You know, you shouldn't even be out here. You start judging the lady for why she's even outside, you know. Imagine, but imagine now you become a person who you realize, oh my God, 
imagine you were given a second chance in this life and you were like okay okay, okay i'm back here so now that i'm back here you know it's like just every the world is alive it communicates through events Imagine every human being taking care of every person, caring for every other human being's blind spot. Then nobody would have blind spots. You know? So many people care, <coughs> excuse me, so many people care for their children. <coughs> So many people care for their children, for their grandchildren, but they don't care for their great-grandchildren at the end of time. We're not living like we care for the future. We're living like we care for the present. And if we only live like we care for the present, we miss out on the future. If what is, if, if like, if the, the civilization we have currently is enough, if this is, if people are like, yeah, this is the best, best civilization ever, then there is nothing left to update. Anyways, thanks for everyone uh, that has listened. Thanks to everyone who has listened. Uh, I would say um, in this episode, this was a more passionate episode than usual, but I would say that really the, the idea to take away is that we have come to a point where we are opening up to multidimensional archetypes. The advanced communicator is a healthy multidimensional archetype. And if everybody, every human being cares about the advancement of their communication, its causal position and its effect, <clears throat> then you will be in some sense aware of the simple and then how the simple has become complex. Then efficiency is everywhere. So anyways, guys, thanks for listening. I hope this episode was helpful. I'm also listening to this episode. Okay, I was about to press the end button. <laughs>
Okay, so this is a poem, the 17th poem, from uh, this poetry work I wrote called Endless Roads. Uh, this part of the talk is for the audience. You know, philosophizing sheep. Once a sheep began speaking about philosophy with the shepherd. The first question was, are you sleeping? So imagine a sheep has gone to a shepherd and the sheep is asking the shepherd a question. And the first question, so I'll read again once the sheep began speaking about philosophy with the shepherd, the first question was, are you sleeping? The shepherd responded, no, or instead of me, you'd be talking to a wolf. The second question was, who is counting? So the sheep is, the second question of the sheep, the shepherd is, who is counting? The shepherd responded, the self of selves, that is the I thought, we call God's focus. After that, the sheep had no questions that the answer could come from without. And that's the philosophizing sheep poem. So anyways, guys, thanks for listening, and I'll see you.